record to the cloud. I'm Sasha Nicole. And I'm Star. And I'm Dr. T. And this is American Therapy, the definitive podcast on all things Black mental health. And we are super excited today because we have something different going on today, Star. So we might have to change um, that little tagline to be like, what is it? Definitive, po- definitive podcast on all, all things mental health. So I think we might be taking some of the blackout. Dr. Royce is like, thank you. <laughs> 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 and by taking some of the blackout, we don't want to misconstrue that we are not dedicated to our communities of color. We are, but what we've noticed is that our shows have definitely been able to impact um, not just our black community, but all communities. And um, and we do care about all communities, but what we know and what we still will continue to target is that there is a disparity that is existing within our minority communities. Uh, but uh, by having the opportunity to talk with guests that you'll see and hear about today, it gives us a broader platform to be able to, to discuss some important issues and topics, so. All right now, so today we're talking about white allies and black lives. So this show came about, because one, we have a lot of white listeners <laughs> that we're finding about, and y'all are vocal. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I had an a online argument with um, a personality who's an ally who's white. And, you know, and, th- and that conversation started this whole like, oh, I have a different perspective because here's someone who's an ally to our community and to equity, yet we have very different perspectives, yet we're still doing the same work. So today, that's where the show came from. We're an all people show. We are all people. We love everybody. Um, and we want to hear other perspectives and not just be in an echo chamber. So white allies and black lives. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Did we lose the doctor? Uh, yeah, here she goes. She's back with Dr. Royster, I think, uh, dropped off, but she's back. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started and introduce our guest for today. Uh, we have Amanda Hambrick Ashcraft, who is a student of anti-racism in the works of BIPOC, the founder of Raising Imagination, a platform that encourages social change and civic engagement, and the executive minister of justice and movement, building a middle collegiate church, an inclusive anti-racist movement of love and justice in New York City. Mm-hmm. She's written and spoken about activism and raising three white kids on numerous platforms, including CNN, The Wall Street Journal, Refine. Binary 29, She Knows, Media, Revolutionary Love Conference, and more. Uh, and she, as mentioned, she has three children, six and uh, four. Both of them are six. And so we're excited to have her. And I love the fact of the, the raising three white children. So that, because that's uh, something we'll talk about. So, mm-hmm. and uh, moving on, we have Nicole Devereux. And uh, after reading Tanisi Coates' Between the World and Me in 2017, Nicole realized that she had been complicit in white supremacist systems of oppression. Her Christian faith compelled her to begin an active anti-racism journey where she strives to listen to, amplify, amplify, excuse me, and financially support the wisdom from Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities while confronting racism in her own life. And she is determined to make mistakes and show up anyway. Okay, now, ooh, that's brave. Make mistakes, but show up anyway. Yeah. How about that? Like All right, Mono. poor little Dr. Royster. <laughs> <laughs> She's having a technical. This is your technical difficulty day. <laughs> I know, right? So, getting started. I mean, let's just start the conversation off. Um, as mentioned, Amanda, I love the fact that you said about raising three white kids because you know we often talk about you know in racism that a lot of these things are bred. And, and that you grow up um, believing, thinking, or, or seeing certain things. And so can we just start off with, you know, more of what you're doing, how it is having children, raising them in a community where you see that racism still exists today, and, you know, what's that been like for you touching on those things? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all again so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, you know, I think one of the harms of white supremacy is making, um, is continuing this idea that whiteness is the norm and that white culture is is normative culture. Um, And so our inability to talk about race and our inability to talk about white supremacy and racism is really one of the things that I think perpetuates uh, white supremacy and racism in this country. And um, becoming a parent, uh, it has become very close to my heart um, to be able to have these conversations with the young people in my home and to be able to then 
model that not as a hey i've got it all figured out and i'm the anti-racist expert you should be following that's not the case but i am a white parent raising white children with an intentionality to unpack our internalized racism and with an intentionality to raise my kids who are not colorblind because that we know that that's not what's going to get us through uh, that's not what's going to bring us towards um, joint liberation that i think we are all called to and that we can have um, as a human race um, so you that is color you know you're not one of the i don't see color people okay you know, no i'm not one of the i don't see color people um <laughs> not. no i think that that's that's a, a a harmful place to be in i think that you know, when I was growing up, even I think um, that that was more common that, you know, we said, oh, well, we, you know, we don't, we love everybody. We don't see color. And that's, that's just not, that's not the way it is. That's just not true. Um, and so from a very young age, you know, we read books from by Bell Hooks to the kids that's called, you know, Skin Again and uh, very, um, you know, easy ways, even from the time our children were very, very young to point out color and to point out difference and then to point out privilege and injustice. Um, and I can say more, give examples of, of those if you want, if that's the way this goes, but I'll stop there and, and see what others have to say. So Nicole, um, you mentioned in your bio that you realized that you have been complicit in uh and, and white supremacy and that i mean i i find that intriguing but also very courageous to acknowledge that hey i think that i've taken part in in maybe not necessarily participating but at least watching so can you share with us you know that uh that mention and and what that has been like for you and how you've gone about trying to um not be a part of that yeah thank you um I think, you know, a lot of it goes back to, so I'm a big quote person. I don't know how all you ladies are, but like, I love to collect quotes, right? And there's so many um, people of color who have said some version of, there's no such thing as neutrality here, right? You're either racist or you're anti-racist. There's no mm -hmm. such thing as like not having a stance. And I think once I realized that it was like, well, I haven't been anti, so I must be in the racist <laughs> category, right? It's just like simple honesty there of um, I haven't been actively dismantling, therefore I have been passively, complicitly upholding. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was really where part of that kind of waking up came for me of recognizing, okay, now I now that I'm aware of my complicity what am i going to do about it and if i don't do anything then i in some ways am worse right because now i know that that's a problem and i'm not doing something um but i can choose to do something and that something is um first looking at myself and i liked what you know amanda was saying about looking at like what are my privileges and where i did grow up in a time where it was about i don't see color and that was you know kind of the uh, look at me like I'm such a good person kind of a thing and so it's really been having to kind of um, listen to black voices and other voices of color and like hear what you guys are saying about that kind of an attitude and that kind of a mindset and um, yeah just holding up like your wisdom against my experience and saying like what do I need to deconstruct from my experience and put this other lens onto it what's it like bringing up like these conversations in like holy white spaces because like it's one thing mm. when we're having a conversation right. and, and i said this to my white girlfriends like i have white friends okay so i guess i'm a little right or a little racist or whatever we want to call it too because i'm like i have white friends i know right <laughs> 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 but one of the things is like I know that like I don't say the same things to my white girlfriends that I say to Sasha and Dr. Royster when I'm like girl <laughs> so like how is it when the door is closed and it's like white women having that conversation or sharing those things is it different like are, are you the oddity or are other white women like having that same space Great question. You want to go, Nicole, or you want me to? Oh, yeah. We want both of y'all. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it's very clear that white women do not talk about race as much as um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. That's just mm -hmm. true. We don't. Mm -hmm. 
then that's part of the harm of the white normative culture because we we have been entrenched in this idea that well this is this is the norm so why would we talk about it this is just what it is and that again is part of this harmful perpetuation of white supremacy in this country so um i have to be intentional about talking about race and about my complicity um, in white supremacy with girlfriends. Um, you know, I've done, you know, conferences and things where we'll say like, oh, this is an intentional conversation. And then we'll have, you know, 100 plus people sign up, which, okay, that's great. But the real work is doing that every day. And that's doing that around the bar. And it's doing that in the club and in the gym and in your house of worship and around your dinner table. Um, that's where, in, in my opinion, um, the real work is. And you know, I'll just say one more thing about that <clears throat> and then pass to Nicole. Um, whereas I do strongly believe that that is the work that uh, white people need to be doing. Um, it is not by any means necessary the entirety of the work. And I'm, I'm always like to say that because, um, because again, white people are never going to be the experts on race and, and on, and on mm -hmm. racism. We're just not. And so if we, um, and I had a colleague who said once, you know, white only spaces are inherently racist because they, they are, they're just, you know, they're, we're like seeding in this system of embedded racial superiority. Um, and so, whereas it is time for us to do the work and, you know, those spaces are um, intentional and necessary um, and shouldn't be on, um, dependent on the free labor of um, black and indigenous and people of color. Um, it's only part of the work. I think the real work actually is like this, what we're doing right now. And I just want to commend you all for pulling this together um, because this in my mind is actually where um, the magic happens, if you will. Yeah, I agree with everything Amanda said, of course. And I think um, I occupy a lot of different white rooms. So the conversations look different based on the room that I'm in. I think in the majority of those rooms, um, I get a lot of the responses that I hear my uh, black friends saying they get, which is like, why do you have to make it about race? You know, why is that a race issue? I mean, you guys have gotten that. So you know what I'm talking about. And so, um, and a lot of that's probably because, you know, again, I'm trying, because I'm earlier in my anti-racism journey, I'm doing a lot of listening. And so I'm really just trying to um, bring in the voices of color that I'm learning from into the white spaces. So I imagine the responses I get are a lot of the responses that those voices are getting when they're trying to put their work into the world, right? And so it's not personal to me and it has nothing to do with me, um, which is kind of nice that I get that privilege, right? Like that it's not anti-me that I can share this. Um, and then I think the other part of that is just remembering that like white people are really late to the game of this conversation. And so if I enter an yeah. all white space, um, part of it is me being responsible for having, and maybe this is a, um, not a word that you guys would want me to use. I think for me, it's a choice to be compassionate and recognizing I'm walking into an ignorant space. And when people are ignorant, um, I can judge them for their ignorance or I can say, how can I help them be less uh, ignorant and make them more aware and be a part of whatever their journey is. And hopefully I'm doing that in a way that's again, calling to the voices who have been having these conversations for hundreds of years, even though I'm just, coming into it. Um, but I think if I start from a place of just assuming the people around me are not in the conversation yet, then it's more of this gracious, like, how can I invite them in to the space rather than judge them for being late? Because I needed somebody to do that for me, right? Like, I, I, I was late and I, I needed people who were willing to say, like, I'm glad you finally joined in. <laughs> so, Dr. T, jump in here. Yeah, I was actually, I was going to ask because I think it's um, a great conversation. And I think one of the things that prevents white people from joining this, this movement is that it shakes your sense of self, the foundation that you have grown up on. So can you ladies talk about like, what does that feel like so that other listeners who may be contemplating this very move can can really understand it you know it's normal to feel what they're feeling hmm. yeah i appreciate you pointing that out i um 
Let me just say that again, because I think it was just so important for us to recognize that when white people start investigating, tangling with, engaging in conversations about race, it shakes the, our identity or who we think we were or who we want to be in mm -hmm. the world, right? And that's a shattering thing. In a lot of ways, it's like the you know, going from adolescence to then living on your own. And like, you thought you knew everything when you were living at home with your parents, and then you go out in the world and you're like, oh wait, these people actually had something important to say and I should mm -hmm. listen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of it for me is like just being willing to be gracious with myself. And because this is a mental health podcast, you know, I'll just be really open. I have depression. Um, I see a therapist, I'm on an antidepressant. And so I've, already kind of gone through a lot of journey of saying like, I need help. And it, rather than seeing that as a deficiency, um, viewing it as um, an opportunity to become more of who I should be, which is an anti-racist, which is a person who works for a just world for everyone. Like that's what it is. So if my, racist identity is the one that's being confronted and shaken up like that's a good thing and ultimately um i want to be on the other side of it and um i can be thankful that people are helping me do that rather than be defensive and kind of dig my heels in and say mm -hmm. i refuse to listen to anybody else because who i am is you know completely dependent on on my my interpretation and nobody else's voice matters like we can't get far in life any you know if we dug our heels on on any topic much less this particular one so i guess that's my initial reaction what what do you think amanda yeah thank you do you want to um jump in there before i do anybody else no go on amanda <laughs> you said bell hooks so i'm like okay she's got the kids reading bell hooks i'm good. listen i'm a kentuckian <laughs> bell and i are like you know um but yeah, I think just naming um, what you named there is so important. Um, Dr. Roy, did I say it correctly, Royster? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dr. Royster, because yeah. I think that um, racial identity development is a thing that happens, and yet we don't talk about mm -hmm. it. And, yeah. and, and it happens yeah. more intentionally in um, black indigenous people of color spaces than it does in white spaces it happens in white spaces as well but again we don't talk about it and so yes at, at a point in time when a white person is finally like holy i've been intentionally um not anti-racist my whole life which is a problem um and then it is this mind shift that happens and um I, you know, I remember feeling sick to my stomach, still do many days, um, when, when you do get to this place of understanding just how entrenched this stuff is in our society. And I want to, uh, I want to caution there and say, and, and I say this when I talk to other white people as well, I want us always to be careful because there's a fine line, in my opinion, of, um, you know, stroking the white fragility and stroking mm -hmm. um, white people's, um, comfort or discomfort in this um because you know i think kind of the trendy thing to say now is like oh we're having these courageous conversations it's like well courageous for who and like who is this safe for because actually i can walk out my door and sit in my house and take a jog and not fear for my actual life and that's just not the same for black people it's just not the same for brianna and for ahmad and for mm -hmm. emmett Till. i mean name just keep naming names mm -hmm. and and so i think that there is this fine line that i'm I try to be intentional about um, pointing out when white people are, are uh, like, and I'm still learning too, but when white people are um, stroking themselves for entering into this, you know, courageous space, I always like to point out, ah, we've always had a little bit more privilege and, and a little bit more safety than the rest of the world, let's be honest. Sasha, what do you mean? I mean, you, you, you occupied two spaces in the sense of growing up, you know, with a white mother, and being visibly or you know identifiably black like what what say you i i feel like your brain is moving i want to know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. oh yeah it's definitely moving for sure um <laughs> <laughs> you know um so it's it's tough uh and and you know funny enough just the plug you know we're going to be having a show later on um 
in the coming month about uh, being mixed, right? And so um, being in two spaces, you know, I have a mom who to this day says things like, oh, I don't see color, which I think is absolutely crap. Um, and where I've grown up and seen um, just a, a subconscious bias that I do believe that we all have, but I think what makes the difference is the inability to recognize that we do have it. And so for my mother growing up um, with parents in the deep part of Texas, um, you know, the, the shame there was that you do not intermix. And, you know, in my experiences in life, I have had more um, positive experiences with, with white people who take the stance from the gate that they, quite frankly, do have race issues than the outright liberals who are like, oh, I don't see color. Everybody's beautiful. <laughs> and, 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 and those have been some of my, my worst experiences because those are the people who I feel like are in such deep denial. Mm -hmm. I, I think like for me, you know, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to make it seem as though white people presently today are responsible for things that have happened years ago. But I do think that the complicity that continues to happen is where I feel like white people are responsible in saying, hey, um, if you see something that happens, that is wrong. But I do, because I've lived on both sides of the, of the fence, I do recognize the apprehension or the fear of being that odd person out at a bar and there's, the bar is filled with all white people and you're going to be that one person who stands up and says, Hey, that's not cool. Like mm -hmm. I, I, it, and it's tough because I have the empathy to understand why there may be out of those 50 white people, 10 who really do feel like, damn, that's wrong, but are, but are afraid to say something because then they then become outcasts of their own community. I, I think, you know, the conversations, you know, and things that need to happen is just, it's so deep, but they do need to happen. And so my experiences have sometimes led me to feel like every white person is subconsciously racist and oftentimes don't actually recognize it or is willing to actually talk about it. And that includes my own mother. Um, and although I don't feel as though my mother didn't love me or that she doesn't love me, I just think that it's so deeply embedded in, in who she is that her ability to conceptualize race in the way that I have to live in the world just isn't there. And so, um, do you, do you think that, cause this is your mother. So like, this is a perfect example. Do you think that she can get there or no, if she wanted to? Absolutely not. I so think, that makes me think, like, is it possible? Like, if you say that, then can we close this gap or not? Well, because well, for me, my stance is that I think for some people, it's kind of like, even if you take it back to just Black people, there are some Black people that no matter how many resources you give them, no matter how much information, no matter how many conversations, that you could give them truth on top of truth. It could be in writing and in every community, Hispanic, black, Asian, whatever, and Caribbean, especially. And, and they will not see that, you know, it does not matter. And then you have those when you say, well, what if she wanted to, well, you know, to be quite honest, I, I don't really think she would ever want to because she doesn't believe it. Like she doesn't believe that you know that what i'm saying like she knows that racism exists but she doesn't believe how deeply entrenched it is oh. in this present day america so when you mention the amads when you mention it's like no like like she just she cannot understand the possibility that even now it's like that no like and so i and i and i question well, mm -hmm. I question why people like in regards to they have to truly want to believe it. Like they have to truly be committed and dedicated to saying, I recognize that this is there, this exists, and that is wrong. And what I have found in my experience is that there's not that many who actually believe that. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, know, and I think that's where, you know, it, it comes down to. D Dr. T, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say, so let me add something because I think it's an, an interesting point and that the goal shouldn't be that we're trying to get them to see like us or think like us because biologically genetically 
correctly. Our brains are wired from the earliest humans to quickly assess a pattern or something to try to identify things and place them together so that we can safely decide which way to go. It's an innate, mm. super duper, like it goes all the way back to prehistoric man. So all of us, all of our brains are going to look at a person and make a quick decision. Mm -hmm. But what takes us to the higher order present day human is our ability to understand that that is a rudimentary skill and that we have to look at more than what our kind of innate first mm -hmm. gut, you know, biochemical response is. Mm -hmm. And then once we make that decision, as Sasha has said, we can see the world in a different way. And I think that's what people's you know shorthand for i don't see color is but that's as as the ladies have you know perfectly stated that's not enough because there is color so if you are pretending like you don't see color then you're denying what's actually happening in your head and then you can't make a change about it mm -hmm. right so you have to acknowledge i see color i i struggle you know to overcome my rudimentary basic instincts um, to see the world and get to know the world for who it is. And, and then that then builds your worldview, as Sasha was saying, about what is safe, what is possible, what is probable, and you mm -hmm. kind of can, you know, go from there. Yeah. And I think, and that for me, I have, um, like, I, like I said, I empathize for a white person who can say, you know what, I do recognize that it's wrong, but I live in a small town in Kentucky and there's maybe one black person. And quite frankly, like, I don't want to have to be an outcast in my own community because even for, for black people, like we don't want to be outcasts either of our own community. And, and I can, and, and I, I can appreciate someone saying I'm afraid and I'm afraid of the, the people that I grew up with, the people that I'm around because these type of conversations you can't have. And if you do, you may, you may be in trouble because when we think about just in, in mm -hmm. history, the, the white people who did say, I'm going to ride this bus, I'm going to stand up with, with this person, many of them were killed. Um, because, and, and similar to, you know, even with my mother where, you know, the, her growing up when it was like, you do not intermix. And, and she was kicked out of the house because in high school she had talked to an Egyptian and her father was like, it disowned her. So, you know, you are no longer part of this period. And I think she was 17 or 18 years old and she didn't see her parents again until well over 30, maybe, you know, my mom was maybe like 36, 37, the next time she ever saw her parents again. Mm. And I had only seen them twice in my life at 13 and at about 25. And that's been it that I've ever seen or interacted with them. And so, you know, and so I can understand when you're dealing with something like that, do you, do you choose to take a stand because, Hey dad, this is wrong. And, 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 and then never see your family again? Or do you say, you know, hey, internally, and I'll try to do something different with my kids, but gee, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go through that experience. And, and I do understand because it, when I think about even my own experience with my father who was black and certain things that are like entrenched in the black community, if you get called out in certain areas of the black community, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to be an outcast either. So... So what do y'all think about Karen culture? Okay, so, you know, I, and I, I have a white girl. Karen, Karen, right? Just making sure. Karen. Okay. <laughs> Look, literally, and she's gonna, she listens to the show avidly, so she's going to be like, bitch, you, you talking my business, telling my business. <laughs> and y'all going to send me word, which I hate. But literally, we had, it too. it's okay. We had a whole, like, I don't want to say argument, but a whole, like, long conversation about, Karen and Karen being almost as bad as the N word, and you're huh. marginal. And and I heard, I mean, because I want to be able to hear that other side. Like, what do y'all think? I need mean, way in, way in. <laughs> Karen's a, you know what? Karen, Karen is a real thing. Karen needs to be called out. Karen needs to be set. Karen needs to be named. Being called a Karen is nowhere near the things that people have been comparing being called a Karen to. And I'm not even going to attempt to say those things because they're that horrific. Um, but but the, this uh, repulsion and this fragility towards Karen is just so not surprising. 
Honestly, sadly, mm-hmm. it's just so not surprising. I was surprised because she is like a very or on. She's a very woke white woman, or at least attempting to be. You know, a level of wokeness, and you know, we're very good friends. And I was like, you really are in your bag over me saying Karen. It's yeah. just like, don't say it around me. And, well, that's what Sasha. I mean, Sasha was saying. You know, honestly, the most dangerous white people are the white progressives because we think we figured it all out. Mm-hmm. We think we don't have any more learning to do. We think we're woke as hell. We think, you know, that our anti-racism journey is done. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, that's, I am on it. One of the things that, you know, talking about identity development, one of the things that I have come to understand is that I am always going to be on this continuum of dismantling my internalized racism and dismantling um, individual and structural white supremacy. And, and I don't think Karen quite knows that yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nicole, what say you? Look. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, I, I read a really excellent response to the Karen thing the other day that just talked about how, um, especially if you think about black heritage in our country, you know, most black people or all, I guess, I don't wanna, I'm not a historian, but, um, you don't have the names of your ancestors, Mm -hmm. right? And so talking, there was this great explanation about, you know, what's in a name and how easily a white person can be offended about a white caricature of a name. And we're trying to compare it to an entire race of people who don't even get to have the names that, you know, are meaningful to them and like, just the massive inequity of even trying to compare those two things. But I think also just going to like a basic human level, Karen is a stereotype, right? And none of us want to be associated with a stereotype. Um, I think, you know, the outrage to that stereotype is maybe um, too large compared to like what it is, but At the end of the day, again, going, you know, maybe I'm being too compassionate to people. It's just this idea that like we all resist being put in a box um, or feeling like don't try to say that that captures who I am, right? And the flip side of that is like, well, but what if I said, well, why, why is somebody putting me in that box? Like, why is somebody assigning that stereotype to me? What, what, maybe I have a blind spot about myself that this person is jokingly or not jokingly, depending on how closely related the person is, who's calling me that. But like, maybe what if I got curious about being called a stereotype and asked like, why, why does that person think that applies to me? That that might be more, that might be a more helpful response. Because one of the things, like, I tried to, like, you know, we were having a conversation, and, and look, I'm, I'm like, having an argument with y'all now. <laughs> this is continuing on from last week. But one of the things I brought up, it was like, well, Karen is not one all white women. We're not saying all white women are Karen. They might have a Karen gene, but y'all don't all have to be Karen. <laughs> the, the reality is that there, there's a history of, and we're seeing it now play out in the case of Ahmed Aubrey, that um, from, from Reconstruction period or from slavery to reconstruction period where um, white people were allowed and, and authorized and still are to this day to any white person can um, ask and question a black person about their whereabouts, what are they doing in a, sp- a specific space, why are they there, are they doing something wrong, and that's embedded in our culture, that's even embedded in our, lo- our legal system, which is some work that I'm trying to do to remove the we still have black codes, like vagrancy, loitering, Mm -hmm. uh, stand your ground, you know, laws like citizen's arrest, which is what I believe will be the defense for um, Ahmaud Arby's murderers will be. And that's, and that's where Karen comes from. It's not, oh, you're just being an ass. It's literally, you have the opportunity, you are legally authorized to make sure that I'm supposed to be where I'm at. And and there and that still stands today. And so she and we had like a real argument over this whole Karen conversation. So I was right. I know you just <laughs> yeah. was right. I know you're right. I know That's that. the end. That's the end of the conversation I'm, right there. <laughs> Star is right. Doctor T, can you speak from a um, psychiatrist standpoint of psychologically, both black and white, um, where you have maybe the white stance of saying, well, you know the mental battle that maybe a white person may go through seeing certain trauma, but not 
knowing what to do or how to process it within their own mind um, or feeling like, well, I'm not responsible for that. You know, I mean, there has to be some, some psychological impact, but then even, you know, from the black standpoint who, you know, you're continuing to see and deal with trauma and, and, and you feel this anger, like what, what would you say from, from that psychology standpoint? You know, it's, it's so interesting. I was actually talking with my boyfriend about this the other day. So <laughs> boyfriend, uh-huh. <laughs> this inside joke. <laughs> But, um, so the, you know, I, I am not as, I guess, compassionate as you are, Sasha, uh, toward white people who are trying to figure out this struggle because we woke up or we were born with this struggle and mm-hmm. we didn't just fall into it at some point in our life. And so I understand that they're late to the game and all of this kind of stuff, but for me, that doesn't excuse it. It just means you need to run faster and harder like I've been doing for generations, mm-hmm. right? Oh. And so <laughs> I think that, that no, I mean, that's just the way I personally feel. And I you know, try to support Black people and white people when they're trying to make these drastic mental shifts. And, and not to minimize, it is drastic. Um, mm-hmm. Because if you really just grow up thinking everything is okay, because that's just the way the world looks from a white viewpoint, to have that worldview changed and shaken, first of all, you gotta deal with that. You gotta reconnect with your sense of self and then you gotta figure out how does this sense of self fit into this racist world and you don't wanna support this racist world anymore. You have to do all that internal work. You have to fight against your family. You have to try to raise your kids as these ladies have mentioned so that you don't replicate it in your own family. But it, it, in addition to that, as a, a Black person, I need you to do something in the world, too. Mm-hmm. It is not enough that you do the internal work. It's not enough that you teach your children. It's like, what are you doing today, as both of these ladies have said, about the systemic racism and the systemic institutions of this country um, that continue to oppress? And so it's, I, it is a difficult mental task and many people <laughs> need therapy to get through it. Um, and many people use their faith or many people use meditation or because it, it can literally be earth shattering, like literally fractures your sense of who you are. Are um, there but, Royster or, or resources that people can tap into to start that process? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, if, if, if these ladies have like, I mean, it sounds funny, but like like support groups, like white people need white people to have these conversations with. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm a part of a leadership group of 18 people and uh, we've been together for 10 years. And I think a third are white and the rest are people of color, all different from Alaska native to black to Mexican, all mixed up, all different kinds. And it, you know, even after 10 years, these are some of the wokest white people, if you will, and they work in systems and they're trying to change. One of them is, you know, they just work in systems. I'm not going to say because they're going to know exactly who they are, (laughs) but they work in systems all around the country trying to change things for black and brown children and dismantle um, these systems. And even they Hi! <laughs> I was like, you tried to the phone. We finished the movie. Sorry. <laughs> no. I work with kids too, so I'm so used to kids just coming in on the screen oh, these you. days. <laughs> they, even they, like you know, life, right? have, to themselves like, and have to have a safe place to talk about how difficult this is to mm-hmm. deal with white privilege. And so, so I guess I'm kind of like going on both sides of the coin where I understand how difficult it is, but you can't let that difficulty stop you um, from really your humanity. Mm Because in the end, that's what gives you your humanity is being able to rise above your current situation and the current stereotypes and the current limitations that might be put upon you. Um, so I think that that's a lot of responsibility for like, you know, white people outnumber everybody in the country and no, they don't. No, no, we don't. No, they don't. Uh, uh-uh. <laughs> well, no, you know what? Don't. White men are only 31% of the population. There you go. Can you even believe that? 
because they're at the top of every ladder. And I'm like, how can they only be a third of the entire population? I didn't know that. I guess what Hispanic is probably, you know, almost the leader or. Yeah. Okay. So when you think about, and so let me reframe my question. Thank you for correcting me. Is that when you are in an environment um, where the majority is white and and the majority um, in politics and a lot of different corporations is white. And then you, you see all of this maybe race, systematic racism around you. Is it a lot to ask a white person, especially one white person to stand up against against that like is that is that a huge undertaking a responsibility because you know uh of of humanity like does that make sense what i'm trying to say dr t Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let me, I'm going to answer it and then, because uh, I, I can't help myself. I'm sorry, Amanda and Nicole. <laughs> but, She's like, well, this is what this black woman does. <laughs> no, but this is your, the reality your place. is the white male was always the minority. The white male ran a plantation where they were always outnumbered. That's why systemic institutional racism exists to keep the people brown and black oppressed and under this white, you know, overlord, if you will. And so the system exists for that. So you can't then use that as an excuse to say, well, I can't buck the system because then you are, as these ladies have said, complicitly supporting, agreeing with, and perpetrating the system. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah the system is working today the way it was designed to work, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's like exactly. something that I always come come back to too um totally agreeing with you there and and it is um an intentional um decolonizing um of the system Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and going back to what you had asked earlier dr t about you know kind of this reckoning with white identity when we start thinking about race um you know the challenge is uh, the system works for me Right. So once I, once I realize, okay, the system works for me, it works for me while oppressing others. I'm either complicit in it or I'm actively working against it. Well, what does that then mean for me? Am I now putting myself in a position where I'm not going to get benefits and where I might actually have harm done to me? I mean, Sasha kind of was talking about that earlier and, and, you know, our brains are also wired for self-preservation So there is a struggle of like, once you realize that you, you need to be tearing down the system that benefits you, it's like, how do we get more white people to agree to that? And, you know, I've had people ask me that, uh, from a political perspective of like, well, how do we help, you know, white, maybe people who are in rural areas who, you know, feel like they're, they're the working poor. And so they, they, of course, you know, are worried about jobs, all these kinds of things. Right. And this is a political question. And, you know, I I hate to say it, but I think at the end of the day, people do want to be their their self-preservation does need to be appealed to. And we've seen that in the workforce, right? The, the diversity equity inclusion efforts, people who come in with that to do that work so often they have to start with like showing the company how their bottom line is going to get better when they you know include other people and it's like we don't want that to be the case we don't want to have to make this like profit argument in order to tell people that they need to be more inclusive um but sometimes that's the way in and i don't want that to always be the way in i think that we need a lot of voices coming at it from a lot of different directions. Um, but if we just look at the reality of who we are as humans, like if we can't appeal to people's self-interest, then I do think it's going to be a harder, a harder fight. And I'm not even saying that, um, I guess I want to go back to something Amanda said is like, I don't necessarily think it's the job. It's people of color do not need to be coddling white people people's reckoning with the fact that the system works for us right like Mm -hmm. I expect to hear people of color be angry like that that is should be an expected response for what you have had to endure and continue to endure and so maybe my role as a white person is is doing something coming at it from a different angle right and partly I'm always going to do that because my experience is different but I guess I just want to say like I think there's a lot of valid approaches 
I just hope people are taking action <laughs> in one you of know, them. And one of the things like, you know, from a political standpoint, from a, a like part of the I see the issue is that we don't know his we don't know actual history we know a story we know the victor story and for real we know the loser story in this country because the confederate narrative is the pervasive narrative around the formation of this country um and so in, in saying that i see where like we don't know that like there's a quote from Harriet Tubman that's not in this you know fictitious movie that everybody loves which was a good movie um, but it's fictitious that we freed ourselves mm -hmm. so like for me sitting in, in spaces in political spaces that are wholly white even though and white liberals you know um one of the things I'm constantly saying is like I don't need you to free me I'm not looking for, I'm looking for assistance where you can provide assistance or open a door, but I'm not asking you to free me. We're going to reverse the black codes in this country. We're going to change the laws. You know, we're going to do that together, but I'm not looking for you to do something for me. And I think that to me has been a bit of the problematic narrative or thing from a policy standpoint because i can best have that conversation with that person in rural america and be like i've never taken anything from your mouth i've put in your mouth more than i've taken from you because i think there's a pervasive ignorance around like there's narratives that that we believe yeah. that just aren't real and aren't true you yeah. know like the majority of social services are white person white people receiving them and they receive even they're receiving them through the farm bill like, you know, there's yeah. white welfare mm -hmm. and there's black welfare. Mm -hmm. And the farm bill is a behemoth compared to what we see in the so social service space. So yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to, can I jump in there for a minute? Mm -hmm. I think um, that's one of the things that I have found to be really important for me to remind myself in this um, work also is that I'm doing this work to liberate myself. Yeah. Exactly what you're saying there, Star. I, you know, and I think that that's part of the um, white saviorism that is part of white supremacy and white normative culture is that, oh, well, I've got to do this work now so I can now save the black people. No, that ain't it. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like you said, like, no, like, you all have been saving yourselves for generations mm -hmm. and generations and have more than you need to do that on your own. This work is important to me as a white person because I will never know my full humanity, who I can be, my, I will never be fully liberated without doing this work um, myself and the, for myself. And um, the other thing I was thinking about when we were talking were these different ideas of entry points into this conversation, which I think is so interesting and we could probably talk for hours about this. And I think another entry point also is spirituality and is mm -hmm. faith. Um, and just, you know, to put that on the table in our last 10 minutes, Ooh, but, you know, the most segregated <laughs> hour in America now, Come on now. Yeah. and it, you know, and it continues to be, and I, um, really am so grateful to work at a church that intentionally tries to be anti-racist, that has, um, a diverse ethnic, um, diverse ethnically staff, and, you know, we, do this type of work even with our congregation but also with our staff because we find it that important but but what i have found very powerful about it too is that it's another entry point like you all were saying you know um nicole and dr t and and, and then maybe it doesn't always have to be what's the roi but like actually what does it mean for your soul Mm -hmm. like what does it mean for the soul of America that we would understand the work of anti-racism as a spiritual practice? Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, so many leaders in that. Uh, Ruby Sales is um, mm -hmm. a femtor of mine and um, from, from her work in the Southern Freedom Movement and the, the work that she continues to do by, by calling us to a spiritual place of this work has been so transformative for me. Yeah. And I like that you brought that up because I take issue a lot of times with black people who attend. It's a specific mega church that I'm thinking of with the white pastor and who has hardly any black leadership as part of um, their church. And um, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand. Um, and, they, and they love this guy. They do. But, <laughs> but there, when, you, when you look at events... And he told him to go to church. He he's having service during the outbreak. And, and but hardly any, any and, and I don't, and, and it, even if we take away the black, there's hardly any 
faces of color in that leadership uh, for that church, particular church. And, and I, I just, I don't understand that. And, and I, I feel as though oftentimes communities of color are much more open or embracing, which is just so strange to me. Um, where it's like, oh, come one, come all, you know, who cares if you're white, you can come eat with us, or you can come to church, or you can, you know, do all of that, and, and it's, it's not necessarily the, the same extension in, in, in those type of situations, um, so I do like that you brought that up, Amanda, because that is, that's another, as you mentioned, I think great point of, of an entryway, of, of Christianity is, it was a tool that was used even during slavery, so, you know, I, um, yeah. I think that's a good point. So, I mean, we are getting ready to close out. I, I'm surprised that, oh, well, not surprised, but we, we definitely could keep talking and talking because obviously this conversation, you know, doesn't end here. It's a constant conversation that needs to be had. Um, so, you know, Dr. T, what say you in just rounding up this conversation? Ladies, you know, if there's any last points that you want to add and, you know, we'll close it out. Um, well, I'll, I'll end, you know, in the, in the way that I typically end. And we all have to give each other grace and compassion. I think one of the greatest gifts uh, that Black people and white people can give to each other is our ear, because neither one of us can work through this until we hear each other. And that means we have to be in community, and that means we have to be willing to share and support each other. Mm. Mm. Ladies, is there anything you want to add before Star and I close out? I just feel really honored to have been invited. I really, um, you know, I'm so new on this journey and, you know, my biggest fear is coming on this podcast and like creating more harm because I'm an extrovert. And so I say things out loud to get to what I actually mean and what I think, but that just means a lot of crap comes out so i guess i just want to like sign off to all your listeners who stuck with us and <laughs> let you know you're all welcome to like shoot me messages later and tell me all the mistakes that i made that would be really helpful and welcome and uh i just i appreciate that the conversation is happening i don't i don't i don't think we should be doing it in isolation right we need to be doing it in community so thank you so much for um inviting me to be a tiny part of the community here I offer my thanks and gratitude as well. I'm so excited to follow you all and to follow your podcast. This is such crucial, important work, especially as it relates to the mental health um, sector as well. And um, just being part of this conversation tonight, it's really uh, bringing into my spirit that James Baldwin quote that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Mm. And, you, and th these conversations are facing the stuff head on. And I want to thank you for that and commend you for that. And just thank you again for allowing me to be a learner in this space. Hmm. And you know, I love a James Baldwin quote. <laughs> Amanda, look, I think you might become one of my new woke white friends. <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm and like, I mean, I'm done learning. Don't say that. I'm not <laughs> done learning. But I'd be honored to be your friend. <laughs> Star would say you. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we might have to edit it out. <laughs> I wrap up with two things. I always have two things, right? <laughs> so my first thing is entry points. And I love that, that that was brought up and that that's like a thing. Um, so entry points, finding entry points on all sides, because it's not just a black, white conversation. It's a black, white, brown, yellow, orange conversation um, where white supremacy has a hold over all of us, right? Um, so entry points. And then second big thing is just, you know, I, as a black person, I can only speak as a black person. So my big thing, I'm always speaking as a black person to black people. Um, is predominantly that we take up the helm and make the change because we are where we are because we did just that and that we learn our history and we really understand and study our history so that beyond just what we're learning in government schools, but 
we understand like how we got to where we are today and that we do that to close this gap. There's no reason that in 2020, there should be laws in place that were specifically built to monitor slaves and post, you know, post reconstruction era black bodies, that those laws should be on the books. And they're on the books in all 13 of the Confederate states and even some of the Northern states. So I think that learn the history and then get in the fight because we're fighting for the future of our country and our children so mm -hmm. and i jump off my soapbox <laughs> no i think that's great i thank you ladies i thank you both you know um just for sharing your perspective and your transparency because i do feel like you know in doing this like we have to have open and honest conversations and i think that we have to be able to respect each other um our, our perspective like i i don't think that it's warranted you know, for us to, for any person of color to, to jump and attack any white person and, and vice versa. And I think for me, my only expectation, you know, of this, when we look at these conversations is that, you know, for example, Nicole, like, I'm not, I don't think, you know, even in this new journey that anyone, you know, should, should attack your, your desire for wanting to understand, to, to do different, you know, because I feel like that's the only way that we can bring about change is, is to acknowledge like, hey, like maybe, you know, I didn't realize certain things. And I say that even from the perspective of being light skinned, there's been certain things that I, I honestly didn't even, you know, think about. And, and it had to be brought to my attention. And, and, and like you said, sometimes it's hard to acknowledge or, or, or own in on like, whoa, like I, I, you know, I didn't realize that at times maybe I've walked in the privilege that a dark skinned black woman can't. And, and, and so, you know, I honor that and honor the fact that we all have to take a look at how we treat each other, how we talk to each other, but, you know, but having these conversations and I'm not, ex my expectation is I'm not expecting a, a, a white person to see a certain situation and say, oh, I'm to blame for that. Or I feel, or I feel bad for that. I'm expecting them that when you see a wrong, that you stand up for the wrong. And that when you see the white person next to you who says, well, who cares, you know, about Ahmad who, who was murdered, that you say that's not right, you know? And that is the courage that I hope that more white people can have in being able to stand up and say, I, I disagree with that. I don't think that it's right. I think that that's racist. And I, and I do respect and understand that sometimes that may be hard to do in your community, but I feel as though until more people can say that I don't agree with that, I'm not complicit with that, then we will continue to be in a cycle. And, um, and so I appreciate both of you ladies being willing to go on that journey and say, you know, those things are wrong, those things are racist, and I'm not gonna be complicit in, in, in that environment. So um, I hope that we can continue to have more conversations about Thank this. You. <laughs> and you know what, and even, you know, in thinking and having this conversation star, like we also need to have a show even with, you know, Hispanics and Asians, because what we do see is that yeah. even in other communities of color, we are still separated and even though, you know, the Hispanic community, you know, have, has huge numbers, what we know, especially on the West Coast, is that there is a huge Hispanic and Black divide, especially in gang culture and other cultures. But even here, you know, in, in, in other areas in the Northern states, there's still that divide just, you know, multiculturally. Um, and Black people always seem to be at the bottom. Girl, um, this, a oh, I said I was at a I was speaking on a poverty panel for um, the CBC and some other you know like policy stuff and I literally I was everybody kept saying people of color people of color and I was like look when I said I'm like look I don't know nothing about people of color I'm black okay <laughs> and my experience is gonna be uniquely black and everybody's like <gasps> Oh right. my goodness, people of color. And I, and I was like, no, because we don't all get along. We, no, you, right. you, you know, as, so. I'm as, black, you. And as black people, black men, black women, we always seem to be, you know, at the bottom of that totem pole. And so there is a lot of other conversations that need to be had with other communities of color too. So, you know, I think this was a great start um, and we appreciate you all. And so American Therapy, follow us, Instagram, YouTube, that's American with a K. Um, you know, and you know, hey, look, and we got merch, and we got merch, we got merch. <laughs> if you love this shirt, go buy it. You can buy one and support our work. 
and Love text it. us at 202-800-2355. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, and go buy some merch. <laughs> Absolutely. American Therapy, we love you all, and we out. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye, everyone.